Okay, here we are with Mark Morris, uh, director, of course, of Mark Morris Dance Group. Um, and just a quick shout out, what you just saw was uh, called From Old Seville. And the, uh, the other dancer featured, we chose that on purpose because Lauren Grant is a Chicagoan. She sure is. Oh, I didn't know you were showing that. Oh, that's good. I know how that one turns out. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it turns out pretty fun, actually. Well, you know, it was a, an actual assignment that you had to drink a full bottle of wine. It's part of the choreography. Yes, absolutely. That was it, especially for her because she's not very large, so she gets shit-faced really easily. <laughs> yeah. I, um, After well, dancing, you know, from dancing, it's all built in there. It's good. It's a good thing. I'm a tap dancer, and you would think that it was intentional choreography, but it just happens sometimes, too. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but we're not here to talk about me. We're here to talk about oh, you. Okay. Um, and actually, you know, I, I do a bunch of oral history interviews for this project, and it often comes up, um, people say, I ask about Mo Ming, and sometimes the first thing people say is, oh, I saw Mark Morris dance there with a bag over his head. Well, at least they weren't watching with a bag over their heads. That would have been a waste of time. Yeah, Good that was point. one of the pieces that was like 80, middle 80 something, right? I think it was 85. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. long, long ago. Yeah, that was a dance called The Vacant Chair. And right. one movement is obscured. Yeah. Yeah. And Chicago, it sounds like Chicago was pretty lucky that piece was only performed nine times. Yeah, it's, it was also because it was so exhausting and damaging that it was kind of like teaching myself a lesson, but it was like, okay, that's, because the bag provided no vision. It wasn't pretend. So it was automatically dangerous. The whole thing was kind of a, a exercise in humiliation just because of, I don't know, that's what the piece was. The music was very, very sad and desperate. And so was I. So that's what that dance was. Nine times sounds like enough then. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. Um, other people have done it. Other, other dancers have done that piece. But I only did it just for a little while. It, was, it got it out of my system. It's a dance that I like very much. So, well, you know, I know that you know it. It, it was a while ago, and you were in a lot of spaces. Um, but I think you were probably at Momeng for a few days. What do you remember about that? Nearly nothing. I remember that I had you know there were people in my company who had come from Chicago and had trained and performed in Momeng. Different people in and out over the years. Many people have passed through Chicago, some have stayed. By the way, I love Chicago, just for your information. This is an aside, I do this, right? It's like, oh, sorry, it's a secret. I love Chicago, it's an actual city. People get so New York-centric, et cetera, and I am, I love it here, but Chicago is fabulous. I'm recommending it, Chicago, yes. Um, I remember there was the sort of a smell of like wood polish and dust and it was sort of, it was all, it was kind of wooden, wooden. The, the, the building was sort of wooden. And I remember, no, that's kind of it, really. I don't remember. I taught for a while, I think, because I always did. I mean, we still do a lot of outreach, but then I personally would teach quite a bit because that was also part of the gig as part of this touring, this touring uh, program, of, you know, groups of theaters that were doing that. Yeah. What, what, did you come to Mo Ming through uh, NPN? I think probably because I was in cahoots with Dance Theater Workshop and we had been all over, the, you know, this one, it was a wonderful organization in the early and important days, what people call the dance boom. If, I don't know if I didn't, I don't know, I was there, but I didn't hear anything. There was a lot of little companies doing a lot of work. It doesn't mean it was all good, just means there was a lot of it. And that was a wonderful sort of distribution, uh, you know, uh, situation to sort of broadcast people's work at, at, a, at a small scale and early interesting work that then we'll see what happens with that. So it was, it was wonderful. And that was, that was early days of touring with my, you know, my just put together company. Right, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> just put together. Um, but I was, you know, kind of thinking about the chronology there a little bit too. Um, 85, you put your company together in 80 and somewhere in there you were also performing at BAM. And, you know, we've been talking a little bit about dualities today and that strikes me, um, you know, Mo Ming, as I've heard it described was, you know, it was in a church um, and sort of a rag. Oh, hence thing. the funeral, the funeral polish, the furniture polish. Oops, sorry. <laughs> that makes sense. The wood. Okay. Yeah, but just, um, you know, thinking about the juxtaposition of being at a place like BAM and then going to Mo Ming, uh, you know, in, in such a short span too. Well, the thing is with, with my work, it's I always, 
you know, what people call a black box theater or, you know, flexible space, whatever people call these things. It just means there isn't much money or much room and you can't have more than 99 people. That's usually what that means. And of course, everybody works that way and you, you use your imagination and you a lot of imagination and not, not a lot of money. And, you know, usually strong support from very, very few people. So what happened is I was always making up dances for the proscenium because that's how I think. So, you know, a dance that premiered early of, of mine, 1981 or something, was a big piece of the Vivaldi Gloria in D for chorus, orchestra, a bunch of dancers. And I did it with a really good recording at Dance Theater Workshop, 99 seats. And when I transferred it to the Teatro Monet, de la Monet in Brussels, with an orchestra and chorus and, you know, beautiful proscenium theater, there wasn't anything to change, except it was a hundred people involved instead of you know, 10 or something. So I always had that scale in my head. It's just that suddenly there were wings to conceal people instead of you just watching them all change their clothes off stage. You know? So it's the same thing. It just got gussied up and, you know, brought to town, but it's the same stuff. <laughs> That's actually, um, I wasn't sure if I'd ask this question, but now I'm going to, since you brought up uh, the concept of venue and everything too. Um, we sadly missed out on a performance of Orfeo here uh, due to venue. What happened instead? Well, it didn't fit in the theater and it wasn't my fault. I'm not casting blame, but you know, sometimes the specs, you know, meaning the details of the theater, the measurements and everything turn out to be untrue or miscommunicated or just screwed up if I'm gonna euphemize a little bit. Um, and so we were ready to do this bit at the a theater there and somewhere else um, in Michigan, I think. And the theaters turned out to be not able to accommodate the scale of the production we were bringing, which was uh, uh, Orpheus and Eurydice, Gluck. And it was too big for that venue. And so we immediately, or with enough time to rehearse it and get it together, we already, we had the orchestra already diminish that. And we did Dido and Aeneas, which is, you know, there are no flies on Dido and Aeneas, but it was a real switcheroo of, uh, you know, at the last minute for the repertory. What if I said gussied up and switcheroo? What year is this, like 1899 <laughs> or something? I'm talking like May West or something. Indeed, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was curious about that. I mean, first of all, just, you know, well, let's pull Dido and Aeneas out of our back pocket, mm -hmm. right? Um, so that was quite a feat in and of itself, uh, not just for the dancers, but I know that you, you have live music with you. What yeah. was that? Well, you know, I mean, if you're, I mean, it was a period orchestra anyway. And the thing is, uh, you know, musicians still get to read what they're playing. Dancers have to memorize it. Dancers like actors, and that's the only way they are. They're crazy in different ways, dancers and actors, but they, it involves memorization. And that unfortunately isn't true with enough musicians. It's true with soloists and whatever. And the repertory changes so much. So you can really just throw something at musicians and they'll pull it off. Everybody does, you know, the show must go on, which is, which is a saying that's very much used to exploit the artists, but we know what it means and it's true, we'll do it. You may have to pay for it later, but we'll pull it together. <laughs> Yeah, um, I want to, we've got five minutes left and I want to um, talk actually about, I know, where does the time All right, go? I can talk fast or whatever, yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, you've got a great archives department there at Mark Morris Dance Group. Um, and I've been watching uh, a few of your initiatives lately. And right now it seems like you're almost working at both ends of the archival spectrum. I know you're bringing some old works back. Um, and also you've got the program Dances for the Future. Um, how, how do you as the director make, uh, make use archives as a resource and how does your company? How do I do it myself? I don't. I almost never ever look at anything that's already happened. I use them to, you know, to look at, to solve uh, problems like what leg was that? It's like, how the hell am I supposed to know? Let's look. Or you know, let's look at this record. She did it right. That's what I meant. Nobody else could do it or vice versa. Or I forgot about that. It's on, it's wrong. I have to fix it. But it's mostly, you know, I'm mostly worried, not worried a little bit, but I'm mostly working on the work I'm working on to use work a bunch of times. And it interests me. I don't, we record rehearsals that I don't watch. So if I'm settling an argument or just reminding myself of something or seeing if it's a dance I want to retrieve from the crypt, I'm sorry, the vault, then 
I do that. So dancers learn a great deal from that. And dancers are much better at watching things and learning this way than I am. I, I was never, it never interested me. It's not that I'm pre-television or anything. It's just that I like the real action. God, do I like the real action right now that it's out of our hands and out of our grasp. So um, I use it from a distance. I refer to it. I ask questions from Stephanie, my, my wonderful archivist, and dancers who really learn stuff about stylistically and you know just about the catalog of my dances and the people before it's been 40 years i'm sorry to tell you so you know some of the dancers hadn't even be been thought of the human beings had not even been thought of yet when this was happening so to look at the style of old wonderful dancers and new wonderful dancers it's changed enormously not even just because of me but because people change and times change so it's fascinating it all, I'm never trying to reproduce the exact way of performing that other people did in the past. That's not interesting. And so we'll see when we come out of this cocoon, we'll see what kind of amazing things have transpired because it's happening. It's, we're not on hold. We're working. You just can't see it. It's invisible for the moment. <laughs> <laughs> right. And I mean, it's such a time. Happy 40th anniversary, by the way. Oh, thank um, you. <laughs> what do you have planned for, for the anniversary? You're looking at it. Vodka tonic. Well, it's, it's time. It's, it's Eastern Standard Time. Um, and, you know, we're showing a lot of things. I'm doing a bunch of talks, uh, old pieces, some new pieces, some video dances I've been working on, some interesting to whoever, different audiences of Q's and A's and, you know, different visits. We're trying to stay visible and viable and keep the home fires burning and be in some kind of condition mentally, physically, emotionally, economically, artistically to come back to some world. When we stick our heads out of these burrows, we'll see something that's, I hope, wonderful and we'll be part of that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, last question. What, um, what prompts you to bring a certain piece back at a certain time? Um, <clears throat> necessity in the, so we're missing something in a show, in, a re, in the repertoire. It's like, I want a, a duet. We haven't done this for a while. I want like a 15 minute dance, that sort of stuff. Or the musical forces we have on this trip are, you know, a piano, a piano quintet. What can we do in addition to this new thing? What's the theater like? How far are we traveling? What can we afford to bring with us musician-wise and dancer-wise? It all affects all of it. And what am I sick of? And what am I, you know, eager to see from the past? And wouldn't that be nice? You know, so some things are forbidden to ever come back. Other things surprise me. The dancers want to do something. It's like, okay, let's try that. Or I'm not quite done watching something. A lot of reasons. <laughs> Name a few, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And okay. I like my job, so that's good. That helps. I'm interested. That's a big thing. Yeah. Hey, after 40 years, the fact that you're still interested. The fact that I'm still awake is incredible, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I feel you there for sure. Yeah, right. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. I really look forward to seeing what comes from the crypt. I mean, the vault. Yeah. Uh, and also what comes next from you. Thank Have you, you so much. Have you had a break? Do you get a drink of, do you get a, like a drink and a walk around or something like that? Are you all right? Um, I'm, I'm hanging in, you know, you I mean, <laughs> oh, that's I good. think so. I think I'm seeing Mark Morris on my oh, screen. God, <laughs> my... Okay. <laughs> right. It's after 40 years, whatever. Okay. Well, wonderful. <laughs> Thank you very, very much for having me and hooray the what you do is genius and necessary. So well, thank you. Work. That means a lot coming from you. Thank you so much. You bet. <laughs>